Imagine if there was a place where food was bought and made in bowl, and then you could go there and eat it. And then you leave with a full stomach and you don't have to do any dishes. You may say, Kendra, I've been to one of those. It's called a restaurant. But in a lot of cities, a sit down meal is expensive, taxed additionally. And when your rent is 50% of your income, that's not a way to get fed, that's for a special occasion. But we see it in movies and TV all the time. A place you can get good soup. Good soup. A place you can drink too much coffee. Please, please, please. A place you can get trapped in a time warp. The year is 1955. When you watch something like Seinfeld, you might be like, how can all these people afford to eat out every night? And there are a few perfect conditions that make it all possible. It was TV set in New York at a diner in the 1900s. <laughs> Seinfeld didn't even cook and his kitchen was optimistically sized. If you're in an older apartment in a city, you're probably already familiar with the weird old kitchen. It's a place where you can cook an egg, but anything beyond that feels presumptuous. I don't cook like a sim, so my one chunk counter does feel a little too small. But what if I told you those old city kitchens weren't supposed to be the only place feeding you? Today we're talking about diners, cafeterias, and automats and the missing piece in modern eating. Let's pull out my time machine and see what a random block in New York had for food options in 1940. This is East 14th and 3rd Ave. Over here we have a Burton's Cafe, which is a bar grill restaurant. There's a soda shop at the end, then a Chinese food restaurant, a cafeteria, and an automat. Now I didn't know how to break this to you, but I don't actually have a time machine. I don't even have a green screen. That's why I look like a low budget Mr. Clippy. This is a photo from 1940s New York tax photos, which were taken from 1939 to 1941 as part of a WPA project. The Works Project Administration brought you these photos, as well as this biblically accurate dinosaur park in South Dakota. But the coolest part of this tax photo project isn't just this one intersection, it's all the photos. There are photos of the majority of New York City building exteriors from 1940. So we don't have to guess what the front of that automat looked like, we can just see it. This automat was called Horn and Hard Art and was a big chain in New York City and Philadelphia. If you look through all these tax photos, you would find a lot of them. This is a chain I remember my dad telling me about and me just looking at him like he was a dinosaur from Dinosaur Park. But once I saw the footage of the inside, I realized my dad had been to the future and I was here living in the past. The best way to think of the automat is like an arcade, but with food instead of Elvira, Mistress of the Dark pinball machines. When you came in, you'd exchange your dollar bill for nickels from a person who really knew how much 20 nickels felt like. Then you could go to the outer walls, which had hundreds of glass doors holding all sorts of food. You can see whatever you want, put in your nickels, press the button, and then take out your meal. You could get a full plated dinner, a bunch of sides, and of course, a dessert. There was even a fish-like fountain that poured you a cup of coffee with a splash of cream. I'm gonna ask my dad real quick what he would get here when he was a kid. Just looking in the window, I have this automated thing, and you'd be presented with this piece of pie or piece of cake or whatever it was. It was, it was pretty impressive. But so when you were a kid there, you would mostly get the, um, you were most excited about the desserts, right? I was, I think. Um, but it, it depends if you were hungry for uh, food. But you, you know, it's not like like you would get a you couldn't get a hamburger there. At least I don't remember that. So you either got something that they cooked as a meal, and I think that that might be under two bucks or something. But still, again, nickels. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. That was perfect. So is that your next show? Mm hmm This is my next video that I'm doing. Yeah. People on TikTok always talk about like giving their kid core memories and it's good to remember that it might just be getting a Frosty at Wendy's. Okay, let's let's look at a menu so we can check my dad's math on these. This menu is from the fall of 1958, right around when my dad would have been going here. This feels like the equivalence of me stalking a Google Maps like menu for a place that I will never go. For lunch, there are special options, scallops with broccoli and green peas, or the chopped sirloin steak with sweet potatoes and spinach. They come with a roll and butter. And the total for each of those specials is $1. Now $1 currently sounds like the cheapest thing to ever exist, but with inflation today, it's about $10. 
and there were even bigger, nicer meals for dinner. A roast leg of spring lamb with gravy, mint jelly, whipped potatoes, and green peas for $1.70. That's just around $17 today. You might now be wondering, Kendra, you said this video was about cheap food. And although I think it'd be hard to find a comparable meal for under $20 in a city today, I do want to point out other parts of this menu. A cup of soup with crackers for 15 cents, about $1.50. A BLT for 40 cents, $4 today or coffee with cream for 10 cents, $1. The thing that Horn and Hardart was offering was a place to eat something no matter what your situation was. The seating was cafeteria style, so you were surrounded by other people who were also there to quickly or slowly eat their meals. There were no waiters who needed to clear your table to make the next tip. And the people going there looked like the cities that they were in. Different races, different classes, different languages, Everyone ate here. One of the big selling points when the automats first opened up was that you didn't have to speak English to get a meal. In the documentary that I used to do a lot of this research called The Automat, Philadelphia's first black mayor, Wilson Good, talked about how him and other black activists were able to meet and organize safely in a horn and hard art. He said, In the 1950s and 60s, I ate so much horn and hard art to meet love. By 1970, I really went off meat. <laughs> Lots of people came here to eat. In 1953, 800,000 people were fed by Horn and Hard Arts every single day. Considering 7.8 million people lived in New York City at the time, and that's all five boroughs, that would be like 10% of New Yorkers being fed daily. We're gonna get into how they made this business work in a minute, but I sold you on a video about diners, and I will deliver. Unlike the gigantic automats and cafeterias, a diner fills a similar need, but at a different scale and in a different location. An early iteration of a diner in the US was a lunch wagon, which used a horse to travel around to locations and get customers. It's similar to a food truck, except there's a horse's butt six feet away. You could sit inside the cart, not the horse, and eat a cheap, fast meal. Lunch wagons were an inexpensive business to start, so working class people found this as a way to work for themselves. Pretty quickly, these carts started crowding the streets. Restaurants got mad, permitting became required. But people had gotten used to the idea of eating a meal in a tiny little capsule. So lunch wagon owners made their setups more permanent. Renting a sliver of property in a convenient location was easier, and it took away the restraints from the food cart permits. It also reduced the horse poop to food radius. And over time, these lunch wagons got bigger and less movable and transitioned from lunch wagons to diners. There were a few companies manufacturing these diners. A few even sold everything you would need and did training. Diner cars spread out across the country from 1910 to 1950. But the biggest companies who produced these diners were in New Jersey and Massachusetts, both areas very well known for their diner culture. These diners were filling a hole in the food that people needed to eat. A diner might be near a workplace or at the end of a dense street. It was an ideal place for small groups to eat at a booth or single people to eat at the counter. And although the quintessential diner feels like a metal tube, diners can be anything. They can be in a strip mall or in a busy intersection or in a storefront that used to be a hardware store. It can be hard to decipher the difference between diners and restaurants because these days many former diners have been turned into like cool nostalgic restaurants. A diner is where you can get breakfast and lunch. A restaurant is where you can get brunch. A diner doesn't sell alcohol. A restaurant would go under if they didn't. A diner seems designed for single people in pairs. A restaurant is ready to serve six plus. And those differences are clear in this 2016 opinion piece from the New York Times that starts with, for the past 25 years since the divorce, I've lived a good part of my life in diners. The writer talks about his journey, finding a diner in New York just to have it close, and then finding a new one, and then it closes. That process continues until he finds Metro Diner on 100th and Broadway, and I'm happy to report it's still open. But he mentions being single in the very first line, and I don't think that was an attempt to get a date from readers. I think it was to point out a big audience of who diners serve. Spending money on groceries and time on cooking might not be efficient or even economical for some single people. And it's surprising diners aren't more popular now considering more people are living without a partner than ever before. The way diners originally worked was using scale to their advantage. The diners look really small, but they can feed a lot of people very quickly. Instead of making elaborate meals, they're making simple, filling food that takes less than 10 minutes to cook. But keeping the food affordable only works when you have an unending stream of customers. And when you suddenly don't, 
it makes it a lot harder. Now I'm a bit of a, a Patrick star, just sucking up any information I can, so I often go to the comments. And they are kinder than many New York Times comment sections. People sharing their favorite diner, their favorite meal, first date that they took with their spouse. And between all these memories is this comment. Diners are all about regulars, and when half the city is reduced to a form of serfdom, forced every year or two to move due to increasing rents, it's hard to establish that. The loss of the diner can be tracked to the loss of rent stabilization. When I was researching for this video, I kept seeing these adjusted for inflation numbers for the food, and I thought, that food isn't quite as cheap as I thought it would be. And once you see what I saw, there's a good reason for that. In 2006, there was a report called 100 Years of Consumer Spending. It covered consumer spending from 1901 to 2002. And boy, what a journey. They have numbers for about every 10 or so years from the 20th century. And the end of the century was kind of a cool thing, so it wasn't just the Department of Labor that was celebrating, the United States Postal Service did too. They made celebrate the century stamps for every single decade. And since numbers aren't that helpful without context, I'll be pairing each decade's consumer spending with its accompanying stamp set. The stamps in the decades don't always line up perfectly, but at the start of the century, we're looking at food taking up 42% of expenses, followed by housing, then clothing. And transportation isn't even on the list. The 1910s is pretty similar. Next up is the 20s. No numbers were recorded this decade. And who can't relate to not keeping a diary when you're going through a manic episode? In the 30s, during the Depression, we are seeing food, housing, and clothing still taking up over three quarters of the expenses. But for the first time, transportation is on the list of expenditures at 8%. Looking at the 40s with the 1950 report, we're seeing food prices going down a lot, but transportation has increased a lot too, at 13%. Throughout the coming decades, we see the same thing. Food prices and clothing going down, housing and transportation going up. At the close of the century, in the 90s, the stamp set has an ominous intro. In final decade, Cold War ends, economy booms. And by the close of the 1990s, we are seeing food, clothing, and housing taking up less than half of the pie chart. But now transportation, which previously wasn't even noted, is the second most expensive thing at almost 20%. This report ends in 2002 and a lot has changed in the past 20 years, but it is interesting to see it through a hundred years. It's not really food prices being increased. It's all these other pieces taking up a larger part of the pie. And that's why that comment hit me. He is talking about New York City, but it isn't unfamiliar for anyone to have their rent increased or to move further away from your daily needs because of cost of living, which then increases your reliance on your car and increases your transportation costs. No matter how you slice up these pie charts, people need a place to sleep and a place to eat. So now let's go to the place that sells beds and cafeteria food, Ikea. The meatballs, the mashed potatoes, the lingonberry sauce, the little lime sparkling soda. It's a complete meal that can fill me up so I can spend three hours shopping like the positive part of 500 days of summer and not the deeply depressed part. But the only reason I can go to Ikea and get a full meal for $8.99 is that I can buy a desk with more consonants than vowels and I have access to a car that can take me there. And that's the deal with most cafeterias meant for adults these days. They aren't for everybody. You see them at Ikea, hospitals, and tech companies. And I'm not alone in seeing how efficient and valuable cafeterias are. That's why Google and Facebook have them for their employees. But at this point, they seem like something that only a select, often wealthy few get instead of everybody. So what happened to Horn and Hard Arts? Their whole system worked on economies of scale. When you're serving 10% of the population, you have to work big. So they didn't just own the properties and the automats. They owned industrial bakeries and food factories. Food was driven from there every day to one of the 45 Horn and Hard Arts that was in Manhattan. It was a system that worked big. The first huge success for this company was during the Great Depression when affordable filling food was what kept people alive. But then as the economy was working better for middle class and wealthy white people, the cities and the automat got left behind no longer living in the places that they work and instead just visiting during working hours. This changed automats from being essential to all to only being essential to the people who needed them most. To combat their slow decline, they used the headline, you can't eat atmosphere, poking fun at fancier restaurants who previously had never been their competition. It was a long descent for the automat. They tried moving food manufacturing further out of the city, that didn't help. Their machines had become more complicated as food got more expensive, nickels didn't work anymore. And with taxes on prepared food, it made it even less simple. But most importantly, they were designed to feed hundreds of thousands of people. And that's not an easy thing to scale down. 
So what was left? They were practically non-existent throughout the 80s, and the last Horn & Harder Automat closed in 1991. Some locations started running as Burger King franchises. So what's at that 14th Street location today? The building is long gone, and on that original block we have a Chipotle, a Bravo Pizza, a Subway, and a Sticky's Finger Joint. I kind of have a sticky finger joint too. <laughs> That's dumb. <laughs> I shouldn't improv lines. <laughs> and sure, we could construe all these thoughts about food and health and blah, but I just want to look at the value. The Subway spicy Italian meal with chips and a soda that I've gotten many times in my life, that comes out to 1446 at that same Subway in that location. Am I full by the end? Yes. But would I rather have chopped sirloin steak with sweet potato spinach and a roll with butter for ten dollars yeah i would like that a lot i'm always really embarrassed when i'm too tired to cook and when i struggle to eat three meals a day because i didn't meal prep or i didn't buy the thing i thought i was gonna buy my mind can easily slip into people have been doing this forever why is this so hard for me but there have always been workarounds there have been affordable food options that let people spend a little money to get them through the day. And communal food and eating has been around since stomachs. Everybody needs to eat, just like everybody needs to sleep and everybody needs to use the bathroom. These aren't luxuries, they're realities. They should be built into a community that works. And you can't eat atmosphere, but you do need to eat something. If this video filled you up and left you satiated, I'd love for you to subscribe. When you subscribe, you're being invited to my internet house, which currently has 6,200 people in it. And this house doesn't have an occupancy limit, so the more the merrier. I talk about old buildings and combine it with pop culture. I highly recommend watching The Automat, which is a documentary on HBO, and it's how I did a lot of my research. If you want to learn more about walkability and neighborhoods, I did a video on Gilmore Girls and Stars Hollow that I think would be up your walkable alley. I'll include sources below and I appreciate you all. Thanks for coming. Bye!